Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today. I will talk about the European Space Agency project uh, in the Climate Change Initiative, or CCI, on forest biomass. So next slide, please. Пожалуйста, следующий слайд. Когда говорят next slide, можно ставить следующий слайд. The partners in this biomass project um, that runs for three years are listed on this slide. I work at the University of Leicester in the UK, but we have partner organizations from all over the European continent. And next slide. So let me first of all talk a little bit about the motivation for doing this project. Um, when we look at the fate of anthropogenic or human-caused carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere over this decade from 2005 to 2015, um, then we can see that there are two main sources. And those sources are from fossil fuel burning and cement production which account for about 91% of carbon dioxide emissions. And the rest of the 9% of emissions is mainly caused by deforestation, especially tropical deforestation and land use. And on the source side of the equation, <clears throat> carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, partially remains in the atmosphere. So 44% of the emitted carbon dioxide actually stays in the atmosphere. That is the part that contributes to climate change. 26% of the carbon released by human activity is taken up by the oceans. And 31% of carbon is taken up by forests and other vegetation on land. However, the sink, the carbon sink on land is not adequately measured to date. It is calculated by simply taking all the emissions and subtracting the sinks of the atmosphere and the ocean. And next slide, please. Biomass is very important in the climate system. That's why it is listed as an essential climate variable by the Global Climate Observing System. Biomass acts as a storage reservoir. And um, <clears throat> it takes up the carbon from the atmosphere and stores it in the soil and in the form of biomass in plants. It is also important to land use and management. And biomass is vulnerable to changes and disturbances caused by climate, such as droughts and climate change impacts on vegetation. But biomass also controls biophysical climate effects through the physiology in plants that influence the climate. And partly, biomass controls fire emissions because the amount of biomass is related to the fuel load in an area of vegetation. On the bottom of the slide, we see a map of the carbon density, how much carbon in terms of tons per hectare is stored in different parts of the world, and we see that most, much of it is actually in the tropics, in the South American continent and in uh, the tropical Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, but of course, in Russia, there's a very large forest area, even though the carbon density in the vegetation is lower than in the tropics. And on the right-hand side of the slide, 
you see here a map of the turnover of carbon in biomass. This is in time scales of the turnover time in years, where the blue colors indicate a very long turnover time. And that is indicating the time it takes for a unit of carbon to be completely recycled in the biosphere. And we see here that actually in the tropics, the turnover time is very short. Whereas in the boreal biome, the turnover time of carbon is much, much longer, hundreds of years in most areas. So therefore they are an important carbon pool because they stabilize carbon in the biosphere over very long time periods. To evaluate these relationships, scientists use earth system models and they can provide information on the residence time of the carbon in the biosphere, facilitate model initiation and validation through using biomass maps, and can also use some information on dynamics and disturbances in the forest. And finally, direct retrieval of biomass changes constrain the carbon budget, for example, in the Paris Agreement process on climate change. The next slide, please. The Paris Agreement, um, which is now in force and um, ratified by most of the countries worldwide, has a five year cycle of global stock taking and is therefore a major stakeholder for biomass mapping and biomass change mapping. Biomass change mapping is therefore necessary to determine the nationally determined commitments to the Paris Agreement for providing a more robust and transparent reporting process for reporting to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It requires information on the resilience um, of natural sinks <clears throat> for climate mitigation and also on climate carbon feedbacks, hotspots, tipping points in the system, ecosystem collapse um, and requests that are made by governments for this type of information. And we see here on, this, on these maps of Africa, areas where biomass in the forests of Africa and the vegetation of Africa um, is actually increasing and decreasing, where the losses are shown in red color and the gains are showing in green color. This is over a six or seven year time period from this paper by Brandt et al. And it actually shows that there are some areas where biomass is on the increase and some other areas where it is on the decrease on that time scale. So it is clearly important to look at where biomass is increasing and where it is decreasing in order to investigate the causes behind those changes. And next slide. slide. So how much do we know about current global above ground biomass and carbon stocks? Um, if we look at the availability of data worldwide, there are several different data sets available at the moment and they are not all consistent. So here the first map shows the map by Avitabile et al. And that is a map of total above ground biomass of all tropical forests only, where the colors indicate increasing biomass in shades from brown ranging to green. On the bottom is shown a map of um, tropical forest carbon density. So the units here are in tons of carbon per hectare, not tons of biomass per hectare. But already we can see 
is that there are some differences between those maps. And on the top right of the slide is a map of total forest carbon density in the Northern Hemisphere, which was published by Turner et al. in 2014. Now, importantly, when we compare those different maps, then we see that there are substantial differences between them. And the three maps in the corner you see here compare maps by Sachi, by Bacini, um, and they show a difference map of the biomass estimates by these two authors, where the difference map highlights large areas where those two maps show different amounts of biomass. So the knowledge of global biomass distribution and carbon distribution is still very much uncertain. And next slide, please. Следующий слайд. Коллеги, следующий слайд, пожалуйста. Sorry about this. Я прошу прощения, у нас завис компьютер, с которого мы слайды показывали сейчас. Мы пере, перевойдем. Oh, the computer is frozen. I'm sorry. Oh, our apologies. We started. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Are you keeping up with the translation or should I talk more slowly? No, I think you are perfect. Well, let's translate. I let okay. translator tell you. But Ksenia is You're it? doing great. Thank you. Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much. No. I'm sure it's, it's, it's the best uh, presentation. Nothing to worry about. You have the perfect speed, Heiko. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the European Space Agency, or ESA, is currently funding the Biomass Project in the Climate Change Initiative. And its heritage is in the Precursor Project, which was called Globe Biomass. And in the Globe Biomass Project, the team there generated a global map at 25 meter res resolution of forest above ground biomass for the epoch or for the base year of 2010. The standard errors were obtained for the estimates and the validation was undertaken at 100 meter spatial scale. And the map is shown here in the top of those two maps. And the standard error of the estimates is shown in the bottom map where we can actually see that it is particularly high standard error of biomass estimates in some parts of um, Asia and especially in Russia, but also in some parts of South America um, in this arc of deforestation surrounding the Amazon basin, where the standard error of the estimates is particularly high. So those areas still require some improvements. The input data that were used to generate these maps um, were from the Japanese satellite Alos Pulsar. That was a radar system with an L-band radar and two polarizations. One was horizontal receive and transmit and the other one was um, horizontal transmit and vertical receive. The second data source was from the European Envisat satellite and the ASAR radar instrument on the satellite. That was a C-band radar, different wavelength. And we also used some Landsat data and spaceborne LiDAR data. So this is based on um, 
light detection and ranging. And we use the ISAT glass instrument for this purpose that provides us with footprints of the vertical canopy height of forests. The first line of production involved um, producing a growing stock volume map at 25 meter resolution. And from that, we estimated the above ground biomass uh, by applying um, a factor to convert growing stock volume to biomass. And this algorithm constitutes the core for the current project in CCI biomass. The next slide, please. Now, on this slide, <clears throat> I want to focus your attention, first of all, on the very left-hand side of the slide, where it says Epoch. And we go from the top in the mid-90s down towards the bottom to follow the timeline. So we're moving from the 90s into the 2002-2011 period, then the 2015-2017 period, and then the most recent 2018 onwards. And we see what the challenge is if we want to look at long-term biomass change. The challenge is that the satellites that are available at any one time are not the same. And we see this by looking at the, the next column down where the different radar instruments are shown. The radar instruments are primarily L-band and C-band radar. And they start in the 90s with the Japanese JERS-1 and the European ERS-1 and ERS-2. And then move on to ALOS Palsa, which is the successor to JERS-1. And on the European side, the Envisat satellite that followed on from the ERS-2. Um, and those were later on substituted by ALOS-2, PALSA-2, by the Japanese Space Agency, and by Sentinel-1, which carries a C-band radar, by the European Space Agency. And most recently, we have missions such as the SAOCOM mission and NISA. We have the upcoming biomass mission, the first P-band radar satellite which will be particularly good at estimating high biomass. And we have some other commercial satellites such as Novasar, which is an S-band that's in between C and L-band in terms of its wavelength. And the Tandem X <coughs> constellation that is operated by Airbus and the German Center for Aerospace Research. In the green column, we have the optical satellites and the longest available data record is from the Landsat series. That's been around for a very long time and still being continued. And then since the early 2000s, we have the MODIS um, satellites and um, we also have the Sentinel-2 more recently since 2014, which is a European satellite with a multispectral instrument. And in the next column, we see the different LiDAR instruments where we had um, ISAT glass as the first mainly cryosphere satellite mission to measure the elevation of ice sheets. But it was also used for estimating canopy height of vegetation. And more recently, that has been substituted by ISAT 2, which has a slightly different technology. Um, and there is the MOLLE mission and also currently a lot of attention is being given to JEDI. Um, JEDI is uh, mounted on the International Space Station and takes LIDAR scans of the world. So based on these changing data combinations, <clears throat> we need to adapt our algorithm slightly. And we have chosen as our global core algorithm for biomass estimation a combination of L-band radar, which is particularly good for low to medium biomass ranges. And that is augmented by information on the forest canopy cover from optical satellites. 
we use a method of segmentation for image segmentation and then um, machine learning classification of the Earth observation data. We use the LIDAR profiles to get vegetation canopy height. And we classify the forest extent and the structural type, for example, into trees or shrubs. Um, and um, this is based on the canopy height and the canopy cover. We also need information on the transmissivity of radar at C band and L band. That is the amount of radiation that is going through the canopy. Um, and we use two algorithms for our biomass production. One is called biomass C for C band radar and the other one biomass L for L band radar. Um, those maps are then combined into growing stock volume maps and above ground biomass maps and are merged to generate a single above ground biomass map. So the biome and forest types that we are distinguishing include tropical and subtropical closed forests, woodlands and savannas, boreal and temperate forests, as well as mangroves, and freshwater inundated forests. And we use in situ data for the algorithm refinement by biome, forest type, and different sensor. And the in situ data we use include existing databases from national forest inventories. Um, to en ensure timely delivery, we also use airborne and ground based um, types of data. And some of those data we use for validation and uncertainty assessment of the remotely sensed biomass maps. Next slide, please. Следующий слайд, пожалуйста. So here's a list of the project outputs we are producing at the moment in this project in biomass. First of all, we are producing annual global estimates of above ground biomass for two current epochs or time periods. Um, <clears throat> in the first year of the project, we are producing a biomass map for 2017-18. In the second year, we will produce another one for 2018-19 and maybe make some improvements to the previous map if we find any areas where it needs to be improved. And year three um, will be used to refine both maps further if we find that there are certain forest types where the algorithm has problems. We also want to refine the map of 2010 that was produced in the Globe Biomass Project. Um, and we want to quantify above ground biomass changes between those different time periods between 2010 2017 and 2018. That's in the last year of the project. Um, <clears throat> we want to also explore whether we can come up with a way of estimating above ground biomass in the mid 1990s to go even further back in time. But we are not quite confident how well this will work. So we called it a prototype estimation. And next slide, please. So on this slide, you see the first map that was produced by the Biomass CCI project. Um, that is the map of 2017. The units here are in uh, millions of grams or tons per hectare. And the darker shades of green show higher biomass areas. So it looks physically plausible. Um, the high biomass areas look like they were correctly identified. And in the background, we can also see the associated map with the standard error that gives us some information on the accuracy of the biomass estimate that we produced. What you can see there is the areas in red are the problematic areas. And that is where the standard error is very high. That means that the uncertainty in the biomass map 
is also very high. So we have less confidence in our estimates of above ground biomass, especially in Siberia, uh, but also in some parts of um, South Asia um, and Alaska and Canada in those areas. Um, standard errors are quite high in some areas. Um, in other areas, the method works better. So next slide, please. So this map has been released. And this shows you the news item that was published by the European Space Agency. Um, and it came out in December 2019 as a Christmas present for scientists to look at some data over the Christmas break. Um, <clears throat> so um, it is available on the ESA website for the Biomass CCI. And if you go to the next slide, then there will be a link where you can get those data. Um, <clears throat> there's a website here at the bottom of the slide where you can download the data from CEDA, which is a data server in the UK, where we also keep the data. Um, and the biomass data is described in full on the CEDA archive website. Um, it is a global data set of forest above ground biomass for the year 2017 and it is version 1 showing that it might actually change to a version 2 with slightly improved standard errors and it attributes the uh, the map to um, the the project and all the teams who have contributed to it um, I should say that the biomass project is led by the University of Aberystwyth in the UK, Professor Richard Lucas, um, who is the um, principal investigator for the European Space Agency. And um, next slide, please. So, Spasivo, thank you for your attention. Um, we have some time for questions. Yes, I'm sure there will be many. Um. So we have a first question from Vasily, uh, who says, thank you for an interesting presentation. Do you have more information about planet MOLI LIDAR and its status, MOLI, MOLI LIDAR? Um, I'm not so familiar with that mission, no, so I cannot answer that question, unfortunately. Okay. Коллеги, у нас сейчас есть достаточно времени, чтобы задать вопросы по проекту. Colleagues, we have enough time to ask questions about CCI biomass or globe biomass. Please go ahead. If anyone has questions. Uh, you show the uncertainties. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Garo, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, probably yes. it's the same question that you were about to ask yourself, Olga. Um, I'm... Um, Heiko, that, that's um, absolutely fascinating. Um, I think a lot of us are trying to get our heads around the possibilities of um, um, global, uh, global, globally valid data sets with biophysical parameters estimated in them. Um, what do you think is the, is the biggest obstacle to having a more accurate estimate for the areas that a lot of us are interested in? So uh, in Siberia, Northern Russia, Yeah, I think in Siberia, probably what we are lacking um, is a better treatment of the changes in temperature and soil moisture in our algorithm. Um, so we know that the radar signal is influenced by those parameters um, and we do correct for them to a degree, but I think the standard errors clearly show that there is some room for improvement here. Um, so I think we need perhaps also better access to training data to refine our models. Um, Biomass uh, as a retrieval algorithm was published by Gamma Remote Sensing and the University of Jena and some other organizations. It's not something I've been involved in developing, but it is based on a water cloud model. And it tries to interpret the radar signal, the backscatter signal, as a function of 
the vegetation component and the soil component, and then from that estimates the growing stock volume. Um, so there could be several issues involved in this. First of all, it's a model. So models are always wrong, but some models are useful. It's a quote I quite like. Um, <clears throat> and secondly, there could be room for calibrating that model and making it more specifically relevant to the boreal biome. So I would like to see some work done specifically on the boreal biome, um, where the uncertainties are currently very high, to see whether there is a way of improving the, the way the water cloud model is applied here in the biomass algorithm, algorithm. And especially, I think that relates to the freeze thaw cycle, um, as well as the leaf on leaf off conditions, um, which can affect the, let's say, deciduous large areas in Siberia. Um, and also <clears throat> snow cover might have an effect. Um, all these things I think can have confounding effects on the biomass retrieval because we run the algorithm purely automatically. There is no manual calibration involved. And I think that's why um, it's a powerful method because it is um, able to run by itself once it's up and running. But on the other hand, it has limitations because it is not manually calibrated and tweaked. Yes. Um, uh, is there any localized training for your algorithms, or is it taking local training data and adjusting for particular regions? Yes, so we use that um, after the estimation, you, we use um, forest inventory data uh, to see whether we got the absolute amount of biomass about right. So we can use that to reduce any biases in the estimation. But the standard error is um, a different problem. So there's a random error and there is a systematic error in biomass retrievals quite often. The systematic error is easy to correct for on a regional basis empirically. If you know what the average biomass is, or you know the range of biomass from forest inventory data. Um, the random error is harder to correct for because unless you know what causes a high random error, um, it is impossible to correct for. And we do not currently have a way of reducing the standard error further in our automatic classification or retrieval algorithm. Yeah, I think yeah, a lot of scope to discuss at our round table, how we can provide more yeah. ground data uh, to improve uh, the current maps. Yes, uh, I should mention probably that um, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna um, actually um, uh, maintains a global database of forest plots. Um, and so, you know, if um, the boreal biome could contribute more data to their database, it would certainly help the development of methods worldwide. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually know from the top of my head how much is in there from Russia uh, specifically, but I think it is a very worthwhile initiative. And of course, Russia is one of the member states of IASA. Yeah, thank you. Colleagues, uh, есть ли еще вопросы к профессору Балцеру? Да, у меня есть. Colleagues, do you have any other questions? Yes, I have a question, if I may. Hello, Sergey. So, thank you for your presentation. It's, it was very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so, actually, we are, we are users uh, of, of uh, Globe Biomass 2010. So, and I have a question about the, 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 uh, the product, which is uh, uh, for 2017. Is it, is it the same, uh, the same method or it's something different? This I did not get from your, from your presentation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yes, the 2017 uses the same algorithm. So it also uses the biomass algorithm, um, but it uses different satellite data, of course, because 2010, um, there were different satellites available compared to 2017. So we had to make some adjustments and update the choice of our satellites. For example, going from ALOS Pulsar to ALOS Pulsar 2 introduces some changes in the processing we had to introduce. Uh, maybe if you can go back to that slide, I think it was slide number eight where I was showing that. Um, we can see it on the screen. This one, yes, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> One 
One slide moving on. This one, yes, thank you. Um, so for 2010, of course, ALOS Pulsar was available as, as an L-band satellite. Um, and 2017, ALOS 2 was available. Um, <clears throat> so we had to change our methods a little bit because the Pulsar and Pulsar 2 data are not entirely identical, even though it is a follow-on mission from ALOS Pulsar. Um, you probably know this from your own work in ICI. Um, that um, there were some changes in the provision of the data products that mean um, you have to look very carefully at the radiometric quality and the geometry of the SAR data from those different missions to make sure they are entirely compatible. And of course, the um, Envisat ASAR um, was a different instrument uh, to some degree, a different mission from Sentinel-1. Um, there are many more Sentinel-1 C-band radar images available now than Envisat ever produced at that high resolution. Um, and the hypertemporal data coming from Sentinel-1 um, are actually making an improvement to the quality of the biomass C algorithm. So that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> having lots of data definitely helps. Um, what we found is with the ALOS data, we actually had to make some improvements to the mosaics that are coming out of the um, ALOS, Kyoto and Carbon initiative, because some areas were affected by intense rainfall events and you could see radiometric effects in the mosaics. So that's why we talk about epochs and not years for the production of our maps, because we sometimes have to use data from the year before or after the baseline mm -hmm. year if no good data are available publicly and for free. And ALOS data and ALOS Pulsar 2 data as well are not free. They, uh, you know, you have to pay for data uh, to the Japanese Space Agency. Um, <clears throat> many of the data sets now have been made available through the Alaska SAR facility. But the main source of data from ALOS 2 is still the Kyoto and Carbon Initiative and they only provide one mosaic per year. Mm -hmm. So okay. I hope that helps answer the question a bit. So the methods are the same, yeah, but same the data thing. sources are slightly different. And, and the may, maybe very short questions. Why, why are you using the, the couple of years, data for a couple of years, not, 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 not for a single year? Is it reason of the lack of the data or something else or what? It is to do with the, uh, the lack of good data, um, good quality data for that particular year. So, for example, looking at 2010, um, if you take the ALOS Pulse uh, as an example, if we have one mosaic for 2010, then if you look at the global mosaic, there will be some areas in that mosaic where there are some problems. Either there could be um, strip lines, appearing in the images, which come with um, disturbances in the sensing process. Or sometimes there can be locally very bright or very dark areas that are affected by sudden rainfall. And those are not filtered out by the mosaicing process in the Kyoto and Carbon Initiative. So what we do is we cut out those areas of bad data and we substitute them with data from the year before or after. That is the reason for doing this. Um, and we find it gives us a better estimate um, and is still acceptable as a baseline estimate for that particular year. Thanks a lot, Heiko. And, and we have, so Olga, is it possible to have another question? Because there is a, there is a, a people who well, wouldn't like to let's, ask. Let's have another short one, okay, yeah. I read in the internet that in Russia, there are two times more forests than in Brazil. So I want to understand in, in our COVID epoch, where are the lungs of the planet? <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, 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 yeah, Olga, the, yeah it's, it's a sort of a wordplay, I think. So where are the lungs of our planet now? Uh, because oh, yes. newspapers say that now there is more forest in Russia than in Brazil. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that, that is true, actually, in terms of land area. Russia has the biggest coherent forests in the world. It's bigger than the Amazon in terms of its area. 
But what the maps have also shown um, is that the biomass carbon stocks are much higher in the Amazon, of course, than, than, than they are in Russia. And that's why people are talking about the Amazon being the lung of the planet. But of course, the Russian forests play a hugely important role in the, in the global climate system and the global carbon cycle. So absolutely right. We should not focus all our attention on the Amazon, but we need to look at all the forest areas worldwide. Thank you very much. Uh, Heike, it was a really informative and enlightening talk and your answers as well.